started. So we're talking March here. I mean, this is, it's hard to believe that March is, is already here. B season is here. Um, it, it's, it's just mind blowing. We've got semi loads of bees coming in uh, starting um, next week from, from California. We've got bees already on the ground that overwintered here in Texas that we're already starting to, to work. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna start working some of those, uh, start splitting. So bee season's upon us and it's just gonna get crazier from here on out. So there's a lot to, a lot to go over. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping things as you guys are familiar with. If you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A box and uh, James and Sherry are gonna be answering any of those questions and we'll go uh, get those answered as quickly as we can. A couple quick things, just you guys are aware of all this. We are still have um, nooks, hives, queens and package bees all available for April. Our April dates are getting full fast, but uh, we do still have availability on all of those um, for the month of April. Uh, you probably got an email from us from Texas Bee Supply, but we have a lot of split classes coming up. We're going to be talking about splits a little bit tonight, but not in the necessary detail. Uh, we're going to kind of give you some high level overviews of splitting tonight. But if you really want to dive in and learn how to make a split, we actually have a class virtually this Saturday. So March 6th, we have a class that's virtual from 10 o'clock in the morning to um, uh, noon. And then we have uh, a couple different in-person split class options. So if you wanna go out in the bee yard and, and do it in the bee yard with an instructor, we have in-person classes as well on March 13th and March 20th. A Couple other free resources you guys may not be aware of that I just wanted to, to share with you in case you're uh, not aware of them. These are two uh, booklets that are completely free that we'd love to hand you when you come in our stores in Houston or Dallas. The one on the right is our monthly tips book for uh, Texas beekeepers. And it's just, it's, it's kind of like these calls, but in writing. And it's what you need to be doing each month for your bees. And so you can grab those at any time in our store, they'll hand them out. And then the other one is our getting started guide. This is new for this year, it's also free. But if you buy bees from us, then you'll get a physical copy of this. And then uh, right before you pick up your bees, about a week before, you'll also be uh, emailed a copy of this. And it's just about a 12, to 12, 12 or 13 page book. And it has everything you need to know to get started. So it, it talks about picking up and transporting bees, and how to install nooks, how to install packages, what you need to be thinking about your first month home with your bees. Um, and a lot of other information. So just some quick resources for free that you can pick up in our store. And then uh, Sherry, if you wanna jump in and give us some of the highlights from this month's magazine, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I can, I can. It's been, it's been an interesting start to this thing. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Um, hi everybody. Um, it's a good magazine this month. And I'll tell you, I think that we're getting better and better. Don't you Blake? I think, oh, I, absolutely. I think it's getting better and better. The pictures are getting better. The articles are getting better. Um, our guest writers are super. Um, and like you've got listed here that uh, recovering from the great freeze, you, you did just a little one page snip on that. I'm going to tell you, it's good information, y'all. If you're not signed up to get the magazine to your inbox each month, go to texasbeesupply.com and up at the top, it's going to say free magazine. But sign up for it because it's going to come to your inbox every single month. And you see listed there the different ones that are in our March edition. April's going to be even more packed. All of this is timely, ready for you to be working in your bees for next month. So please do that. And if you've got some suggestions, we've got a little poll going right now and we're really liking the answers. Sounds like most of you love the magazine and we're thrilled about that. Um, but uh, if you've got some suggestions, we'd love to hear it. And uh, please submit uh, photos and um, any recipes or anything else that you'd like to see in the magazine. But I think that's it. We, we love having you read it. We love making it, don't we, Blake? We sure do. Almost always. Um, <laughs> almost always. That's Sherry right. always loves it. 
And I, I, I almost it. always love it. Yep, yep that's right. <laughs> I do, but I'm there for you. It's all good. <laughs> we couldn't do it without Sherry. She does 99% of it. So thank you, Sherry. Okay, uh, let's let's jump into March. So, um, you know, I feel like in February, we I feel like we were closer to spring in February, uh, the beginning of February than, than we were in March. Uh, this is our Houston location. And this isn't that much snow compared to what we got in North Texas. Our North Texas location, you couldn't see our parking lot because there was eight inches of snow on the ground. But this is this is Houston. I mean, this is uh, stunning. You know, I mean, it's, it's a decent snowfall in, in Houston and the whole state had that. So one thing we're gonna be discussing tonight is kind of what does that mean for spring and, and what happened to spring and uh, kind of some post, uh, some, some maybe some therapeutic um, post freeze analysis uh, that, that we're gonna do here. You know, spring blooms are obviously behind now. And this is kind of what I'm seeing uh, the far left here, you know, the freeze has killed back a lot of our yellow mustard I see a little bit of it, but it kind of got froze back and it's it's running late. I am seeing a strong resurgence of dandelions. Those those little suckers are tough. And as we all know, any of us that uh, have a, a, a yard that we routinely mow know, those are tough flowers and they are in full bloom again. They fully recovered. The hen bit, the purple flower there is really tough and it's in full bloom again as well. It, it slowed it down. But it's very, very cold resistant and, and it's you're starting to kind of see in, in areas that have been a bit kind of that sea of purple again. And then the far right, you know, the elm, the elm was about about half of the elm in Texas was finished blooming when the when the freeze hit. And and so anything that was in bloom with the elm, it it killed it. But I am starting to see just in the past few days, I'm starting to see some of the elm that hadn't bloomed when the freeze hit start blooming now. So we're kind of getting a resurgence of elm way later than normal because of that freeze. And uh, you know, some, some other decorative bushes are starting to bloom as well, especially if you're in Southeast Texas, but that's about it. I mean, we're not seeing the level of bloom yet that I like to see. So definitely delayed by a week or two. Uh, but it's, it's catching up fast. Um, so recovering from the freeze, you know, what did we take away from this as beekeepers? As, as most of you, you know, this was a picture of, of the inside of our house for two and a half days um, and the snow outside. I've got to say, uh, my two young daughters thought it was just the greatest thing that had ever happened in all their lives. They had an absolute blast with no power and snow for, for a week. <laughs> so um, their parents... Not so much, but but they had an absolute blast. Um, so kind of from a from a beekeeping perspective, you know what are what are we seeing? You know, looking back and kind of doing a full damage assessment. You know, looking at my own operation, my own bees, looking and talking to a lot of other beekeepers from small scale to commercial beekeepers. You know, the the damage has been pretty severe. Um, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of sideline and commercial beekeepers who had their bees in Texas and. You know, the losses range from anywhere to 10 to 30 um, percent just because of that cold, which is pretty high just from one severe cold spell. Um, and, and kind of with that, and I've seen this too, we lost bees that were weak. So kind of like we predicted before the freeze hit, you know, anything that's three frames of bees or less died in, in a lot of cases. And the one thing that I also saw and a lot of other folks saw that we certainly didn't want to see was very strong hives. If you had um, really, really strong hives that were brooding up heavily and uh, didn't have a lot of stores, then they some of those died because they, they didn't have enough food stored to survive, which is one of the reasons I pushed so hard on, you know, making sure that you've got those reserves that we're always talking about no matter what time of year it is. So we'll talk about that more in a minute. So overall, you know, some pretty significant losses. It's certainly slowed the spring down, but spring is starting to catch back up. I mean, we're, we're getting some pretty warm temperatures now and the past week and, and the, the coming week. And so, you know, I, I'm kind of seeing spring is starting to make up for lost time. Flowers are pushing out hard. And, and I, I kind of think within a couple of weeks, we're gonna be synced back up with normal bee growth 
and flower, flower, flower bloom. So just keep in mind, you know, this is a good time to repopulate equipment. So if you did have lost bees, then uh, package bees are a great way to, and an economical way to dump packages of bees right back into that equipment. Uh, we still have uh, packages left. We sold a ton um, after the cold, and um, but we do still have some packages and nooks left if you need to repopulate that equipment. And then the last point there is just implications for our future honey crop. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, and if I guess, I'm probably going to get it wrong. I, I'm I'm going to um, cautiously predict that it's not going to have much of an effect on our on our honey crop and and our summer blooms. I, I cross my fingers. I think that the, the harsh freeze was early enough that uh, that those spring or those summer nectar producing plants that we rely on um, weren't affected or have time to recoup. So I, I think we're going to be okay uh, honey flow wise, which is which is great for all of us that hope to make honey crop. So before we move on from this, I want to just, I know I usually launch a poll at the end, but I want to launch a poll for you guys to take really quickly. And I'll, I'll share this um, so you guys can all see the result. Um, but it asks two questions, you know, did you lose hives as a result of the cold and snow? So kind of a yes or no. And then the second one, what percentage of your hives did you lose? You know, did you lose half? Did you lose none? Did you lose 100%, et cetera? And, um, we, we publish results of all these polls in our Texas Bee Supply Monthly Magazine. Um, but it sometimes, I mean, we have so many hundreds of beekeepers on these calls that, you know, we get a pretty good feel of what's going on in the state um, when we, uh, when we at, take these polls. So um, it looks like um, not, uh, looks like right now, 31% of you uh, did lose bees and, um, and it, it varies a lot from 0% uh, loss to, looks like the most common is 21% of folks lost one to 25% of their hives. So I'll, uh, I'll share those results, there you go. So you guys can see those results, but looks like a lot of folks lost hives, about 32% of people lost bees. And that's, that's really unusual. You know, the average annual loss rate for bees across America is 44%, but that's annually. So 44% annual loss is what's normal. Um, and uh, you know, usually you lose that over the course of a year. So to have such a, a big, such a large number of people lose bees as a result of one weather event, and uh, it is kind of a big deal. So certainly unique times in, uh, in, in beekeeping. So. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's move on um, to more exciting things than, than the freeze that we had. So current conditions, you know, what I'm seeing now that the weather's warmed back up, freezes have kind of moved on, you know, brood rearing is behind. I'm seeing brood rearing about two weeks behind, but it's starting to increase rapidly. And so I am seeing hives do their best to make up for lost time. I'm seeing a return of a pollen flow across much of the state but many hives still have really low stores. It was kind of a double whammy where, you know, the hives were starting to brood up naturally, pollen flow was coming in and they, the queen started laying a lot. Then you had this super cold spell um, where they didn't have pollen, not only for that cold week, but it also killed back all the plants. And so you had a lot of brood in the hives uh, because hives start brooding up in early February, late January really in Texas. And then they lost all their pollen stores. So, um, you know, a lot of hives still have, you know, low pollen stores in the hives, but they're starting to return. Temperatures appear pretty steady. You know, looking at the extended forecast, I don't think, you know, we have any major surprises on the way, which is great. And then I'm seeing super strong hives, you know, rapidly making up for lost, lost time. So those really good, strong hives are quickly recouping their strength and growing, even though they're a little behind. This is what I'm seeing inside hives, you know, as I, as I look, you know, I'm seeing pictures on the far left here, which is a little knot of bees, uh, you know, maybe a half a frame of bees and that's it. it kind of everything else got killed off from the freeze. Uh, the middle there is what I'm kind of seeing in stronger hives where you've got a decent amount of pollen and then you've even got some cat brood 
and then you've got eggs. And so there was kind of that natural brood break during that cold spell when the queen shut down. And so you kind of have eggs and larva uh, and no cap brood, or you've got eggs and cap brood, you know, kind of signifying that break in the brood cycle. And then what I'm seeing a lot of is this picture over here on the far right is a lot of eggs and larva. And so I'm, I'm really seeing those queens kind of kick into high gear and really start uh, laying those eggs like crazy in the, in the strong hives. So um, one quick note here, just kind of as we're talking about what we're seeing in the bees, we're gonna do something different starting in April. And that's because the daylight savings time kicks in and it's light after 6.30 in April. So um, starting next month, here's what we're gonna do. From 6.30 to, to 6.50, we're gonna have a beekeeper in the bee yard uh, filming through Zoom live um, talking about what we're seeing in the bees. And so for 20 minutes at the beginning of these webinars, um, it'll actually be streaming live from the bee yard and we're gonna be going through hives, showing you stuff in hives, talking about things that are easier to illustrate in the bee yard. So that'll be live. And then from 6.50 to 7.30, we're gonna do kind of what I always do in these webinars, which is the high level practical monthly tips. And then from 7.30 to eight, we'll have someone off in the Elums doing kind of a deep dive into one or two practical timely topics. So no real change except for the first 15, 20 minutes, we'll actually have one of our bee experts out in the bee yard uh, zooming in. So pretty excited about that. I think you guys will love that. So feeding for March, you know, I'm still going to say you need to try to maintain uh, that 20 pound surplus in the second box of hives that are at least one deep box full of bees throughout March. And, you know, we shouldn't see the cold front that we just saw, but you can still have cold weeks. Um, the, the nectar producing flowers are behind schedule, yet the temperatures are warming up and the bees are trying to grow. So it uh, doesn't mean you need to feed, you know, you, you may have a hive that has more than enough food, but just be observant and, you know, check your hives two or three times throughout March and make sure that you're maintaining about 20 pounds of excess in that second box. Bees are growing fast and they eat a lot of food when they grow and they may not necessarily be able to bring in enough food to grow like they need to. So um, you know, I, I totally understand not wanting to feed bees. And in most cases, I don't like feeding bees either. It's better for bees to forage naturally uh, on, on natural forage than, than feeding a sugar syrup. Um, I'm all for that. But I also strongly believe in taking care of our bees and, and, and they are animals and we are responsible for them. And we're responsible for making sure they have the nutrition and the food that is necessary, not only for their sake, but that's, you know, a beehive runs out of food, they're going to struggle. And, uh, and, you know, we would never do that to any other animal. So um, keep an eye on the food, continue feeding one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Uh, you know, that's what's recommended throughout spring and, and throughout most of the summer, even. We won't switch back to two-to-one until this fall. You know, division board feeders or top feeders are still recommended rather than the entrance feeders. The entrance feeders can really encourage robbing because it's a lot of syrup kind of really accessible right at the front of the hive. So I still recommend division board feeders or top feeders um, while we don't have a lot of flowers blooming. And then, you know, like I said, check those stores two to three times through March to make sure they've got enough food. Okay, so uh, another topic, now that we're getting into spring, let's talk, a, while we're on the topic of feeding, splits, new hives, nooks, and packages. So a lot of you, probably all of you fall into uh, having one of those in the next month or so. You're probably either, if you're an existing beekeeper, you're probably gonna make splits in the next one to two months. If you're a brand new beekeeper, or even if you're a not and you lost bees or just wanna grow your hives, you're probably gonna be buying nooks, packages or complete hives. So um, now what? Now this is gonna be something we talk a lot more about in April uh, because that's really when most people do splits or buy bees. But um, start thinking about this as far as what you need to do as, as far as feeding anyway, when it comes to those new splits or hives. The first thing you need to consider is feed one-to-one -one syrup until the first brood box is 80% full of bees and that comb is drawn 
uh, in the first brood box. So when 80% of the comb is drawn in the first box, that's when it's time to, uh, you know, to add your second box. The next step is add your second brood box, whether it's a deep or medium, and feed one-to-one -one sugar water until the second box is also 80% drawn out comb. That might take anywhere from two weeks to two months, depending on a lot of different conditions. And feeding that syrup is just gonna let them draw that comb out faster because it takes 11 pounds of honey or syrup to make one pound of beeswax. So feeding can encourage them to draw out comb faster, which means you've got a greater chance of making a honey crop that year. Um, third step, if it's still before mid-June or so, and they've got both your brood boxes drawn out, then you can add a honey super and stop feeding and let them finish drawing out that honey super with natural natural nectar coming in um, rather than, uh, you know, rather than the syrup you're feeding. And if you keep feeding them syrup, they'll just store it in the honey super and you'll have uh, sugar water instead of honey. One quick note here is that the goal is to balance feeding, to give plenty of resources to help bees draw comb and grow quick, quickly without giving so much syrup that they fill the brood nest and the queen can't lay. And we'll talk again more about that balancing act in April, but just keep in mind, you know, you don't wanna just give them an unlimited amount of syrup uh, without checking them to make sure that they're not just storing it all in the brood nest and the queen doesn't have anywhere to lay. You know, you always want to see plenty, you know, two thirds of the frames in the brood nest, uh, you know, two thirds of the frames, two thirds full of brood. You know, if you've just got, you know, frame after frame in the brood nest of nothing but honey or stored syrup, that's not a good thing because the queen needs room to lay. Now, I want to see a couple frames in the bottom brood nest with syrup in them or honey, but, uh, you know, I want to see more frames than not with room available for the queen to lay. So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act, but in most cases, if you've got a strong hive, you know, at least one deep box that's two thirds or full of bees or completely full, you know, and you can feed them up to, you know, a gallon a week or so of light syrup, uh, and they'll, they'll do just fine with that. So we'll, we'll get into more of that in May. Okay, um, I want to show you guys a video, and I think I found out finally how to make these videos stream a little bit better. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys a video on um, what I just discussed, and um, it, it illustrates it a little more clearly. So I'm going to pull it up really quickly. So give me a quick second. And this is going to um, allow me to share uh, these videos um, in a way that I think is going to stream a little bit better. Here we go. All right, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna narrate this because the uh, audio wasn't great because I cut the audio because you can hear bees incessantly hitting the uh, microphone. So this is a single story hive that kind of like what we just talked about. And you can see when you open the lid that it's pretty much full of bees. And uh, this is one that just at a glance, you know, looking at the top box, I'm, I'm going, you know what, um, that's, uh, that's about ready for bees. So, you know, one thing that uh, I, do next is I pull the outside frames um, from that hive like you see here and, and see what's going on there because I'm trying to see hey how much of the bees drawn out. In this case you can see they're they're finishing off drawing out the the back side of that outside frame um, and then the next frame you'll see that they're kind of doing the same thing. Now I'm only going for 80 percent drawn so you know you can see that here's the other outside frame and they've got you know a third of that one side drawn and uh, none on the back side. But this one's definitely ready because I'm, again, I'm only going for 80% drawn out and 80% full of bees before I'm ready to add my second brood box. So this one's more than ready. It probably could have been added a week sooner because they're already working on heavily those two outside frames and uh, which represents, you know, about 80% drawn out. So at this point, 
you know, I would absolutely add a second brood box. You know, that could be a deep box or it could be a medium box. It's your preference. Either way is fine. This happens to be a medium for a second brood box. Um, it's 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 kind of your your preference. Um, so uh, I would also give this hive, like I mentioned, some more syrup, and I would keep feeding them that light syrup until they've got that second brood box, uh, you know, about 80% drawn out, and then it would be time to add my next honey super. So um, kind of with that, you know, one other thing I want to share with you guys here is um, I want to share with you, you know, a, a decision a lot of us are often trying to make is, uh, you know, should I have medium boxes or deep boxes for, um, you know, for a brood nest, you know, should I have deeps or medium? So I want to share with you real quick um, someone else's opinion, and that's uh, a great friend of ours, Lauren Ward. And Lauren um, recorded a quick video for us that showed up in our Texas Monthly Magazine just discussing, you know, should you have uh, two deep boxes for brood nests or a deep and a medium? And so I'm going to let you hear um, her answer, her answer here. So the number of brood boxes to use and whether it's deeps or mediums, I think a lot comes down to personal preference and your goals keeping bees. Um, I kind of use whatever the bees tell me they need. <laughs> Um, I do sometimes find it hard in some areas of the world where bees don't build up quite as quickly to build them up into two uh, brood boxes. That's a whole lot of bees, um, but I absolutely do it. There are some areas where I kind of like two brood boxes. So bees around Houston and heavy tallow country where they're bringing in a lot of resources all at once and building up really, really quickly. Sometimes two brood boxes is nice. Um, if you really kind of boil it down to my personal preference, I think I'd probably end up somewhere around a deep and a medium. So a little story and a half. Um, to me, just like I said, personally, that is a nice size. If it's in someone's backyard, you don't have just a ton of bees boiling out every time you open it up. Um, you can make good honey off of that. And they're not just about to swarm by having that little bit of extra space. Um, but it really does depend. And, and this, is, this is my one answer where it depends is, <laughs> is the answer. Um, you may love having all deeps, not having any mediums. Everything is interchangeable, um, or you may not, and that's that's a personal preference thing. Um. So yeah, I mean, and, and I, 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 I agree with Lauren. It, it is kind of a, a personal preference, you know, decision, you know, what, what do you prefer? Um, you know, and it, it is a bit geographical, you know, I, I, often recommend, you know, as she did, you know, if you're in Southeast Texas, it, you know, double deep work really well because you've got bigger honey crops. If you're in other parts of the state, a deep and a medium is fine. You know, the one caveat I often give is if you really want to do a lot of splits next year, you know, if your goal is to really grow and you want to make a lot of splits in the future, double deeps are great. Two deep boxes for your brood nest is great because then you've already got your brood nest drawn out and ready to make splits next year. You know, if your primary goal is only have a couple of beehives and you really want to make a lot of honey and not grow a lot, deep in a medium is great because you're going to have more honey stored up in your upper honey supers and less in that second brood box because it's smaller. So, um, cool. Well, um, sometimes I feel weird not pausing for questions after we switch topics, but uh, I'm going to let you put them in the Q&A box and, and have James and Sherry uh, answer them for you. But so pollen patties in March, largely unnecessary. I mean, I know I just said that in, uh, <laughs> I know I said that in February and then look what happened, but um, barring any bizarre weather events, you know, we shouldn't really need pollen patties in March. You know, we were, we're the pollen flows recovering. Um, the one caveat would be, you know, watch for those cold weeks. And, you know, if you, if you see a really cold week coming up, then go ahead and give them a pollen patty. You know, if they're if they're not able to fly for, you know, three or four days because it's too cold, you know, under 55 degrees or so, doesn't hurt to give them a pollen patty. You know, if you see, if you currently see less than a half a frame cumulatively of stored pollen in your hive, 
and you've got a deep box full of bees or more. So a pretty strong hive with less than a half a frame of pollen cumulatively. Wouldn't hurt to give them a pollen patty just to help them kind of recover as blooms are still recovering from this freeze. So, but it, for most hives in most regions, you don't really need pollen patties uh, at this point. If you have pollen patties, give it to them. It's certainly not gonna hurt them. Uh, you know, there's, there's beekeepers on all levels that, that uh, give pollen patties throughout the month of March and, and, and really swear by uh, the effect it has on their bees. They say, you know, our bees grow faster, have more brood, we can get more splits if we keep feeding the pollen substitute through, through March. So if you've got it and you want to feed it, you, per you certainly can. If you've got it and you don't want to feed it, you can throw it in the freezer and store it for this next fall. So you don't, you don't have to use it up. March varroa mites, you know, I'm just going to make a couple broad comments here because, you know, in most cases, most people don't have to treat for varroa mites in the spring. I do recommend you do a test, you know, check out our YouTube channel or our website. And we've got a lot of videos and articles on how to do tests appropriately. But in most cases, you don't have to worry about varroa mites in the spring. However, if after doing the test, which I do recommend you do, just perform a test to make sure, if you do have over two mites per 100 bees, March is a really good time to do a treatment. So as far as what type of treatment to use this time of year, I'm working on a tool that looks at all treatment methods, both natural, conventional, and treatment-free, um, so mechanical, um, and compares all those treatment options and shows you which one is best um, and how to use it certain times of the year within Texas. Until we finish that, uh, I really recommend you Google Honeybee Health Coalition Varroa. And when you Google that, the first thing that comes up is going to be a pretty awesome um, quiz, if you will, that, that asks you questions about your bees. And by answering, it guides you to not only what uh, treatment option or natural option you prefer, but then it also tells you with a video and text how to use whatever option uh, is recommended. And that, again, they've got options for natural and chemical. So um, I would really recommend the test do a test. And if you do have more than two mites per hundred bees, go to the Honey Bee Health Coalition Varroa decision chart or decision tool, and, and they will walk you through uh, how, to, how to do it. What we're trying to do is make that for Texas. So it's a little more applicable to Texas, but um, for now theirs is fantastic. We talked about this in February, so I'm not really going to jump into it too much, but you know, sticky boards are a great, great tool. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all these steps again because we did cover it in February and you can check out that recording. But don't forget, if you don't wanna do the alcohol wash and kill bees when you test for mites, you can use the sticky boards and insert it underneath your screen bottom board or inside your screen bottom board. And it's a great tool to test for varroa mites without even opening up your, your beehive. So check out the, the February, uh, Zoom call if you want all the details on the sticky boards and uh, we won't spend too much time on that. March, if your bees did survive the cold, uh, which hopefully they did, looks like for at least 63% of you on the poll, they did. That's a, you know, you may have hives that are overcrowded and, and we're, you know, I have this problem too. Some of my hives are bursting at the seams and uh, you can't get queens yet because most people don't start selling queens until April. So you, you've got a great problem. When the top box becomes 80% full of bees, it's time to do something. You've got three options. You can make a split, which I don't really recommend this early in the year because you can't get queens. You can add boxes, which I do recommend. Just add another box and you can equalize. And I'm not, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. The Elons are gonna get into some of this in more depth later. And then you can also check out our February Zoom call where we went into great detail on each one of those. Um, but I do want to talk about splits just quickly. And um, we're gonna let Lauren Ward talk about splits um, again. And she's got a quick clip for us on exactly how to, um, how to make splits in, in a nutshell. So hang tight, let me share this. And there we go. And we'll let Lauren take it from here. Um, 
So for spring splits, if that hive is really populous, but it's not raising its own queen cells yet, it's not trying to swarm, um, most of the time what I'll do, um, say I have a double deep, that's the easiest, <laughs> easiest one to imagine. Um, I will go in, I'll take that top deep off, I'll set it on its new bottom board, I'll go through, I'll find that old queen, um, usually. <laughs> you, you can do this a number of ways, but I'll usually go find that old queen. Um, most of the time, if they're not swarmy, I will actually leave her in the original hive. And I'll distribute resources. So I'll distribute brood, I'll distribute honey. Um, one of the things to kind of remember, especially in the situation where you're in that same yard, is like I said, you're going to get a lot of those bees that have already flown out of the hive to forage, they're going to go back to their original colony. Um, and so when I make a split in the same yard, I really, I skew towards moving a whole lot of sealed brood, which means pretty soon going to be new bees, um, and a lot of nurse bees into that new hive that's going to get the new queen and it's in a new location. Um, that's kind of just hedging my bets. So whenever I look at that split that I'm going to make, and it's in a new location, like I said, it's going to get a new queen they don't know yet. I'm kind of looking at the bees I've moved with it and saying, well, maybe half of you will stay. <laughs> so you have to have enough bees left and you have to have enough emerging bees coming up after that um, to take care of everything in that hive. And so that's what I'll do. If they're looking really swarmy, like I kind of said earlier, if they're raising queen cells, a lot of the time I'll move that old queen. Um, that's the, that's kind of the, the simple split method. So, um, but the other way I'll do it is say I have a yard I have a lot of yards that are going towards ag exemptions. And you know, you have your five years to make them. And so sometimes they'll start out with two hives and they'll need eight, right? And so I expect every year I'm gonna try to make some splits. Well, if none of those hives are double deeps full of bees that could be split outright, I'll go in, I'll actually find, okay, a hive, this hive can give a frame of honey and a frame of brood. This hive can use a frame of brood. And I'll move the brood, the honey, and the nurse bees, but no queens. <laughs> and I'll kind of build a hive a frame at a time. And this is a pretty common technique also. Put a new queen in it. Um, and again, I'm going to give it more sealed brood um, than anything else. Like some open brood is good, but sealed brood is pretty soon going to be an adult bee. Um, and, and the one thing I, I think I didn't cover very well was I want to make sure that there is enough brood to do that. And so if you have a hive full of bees, but there's only three frames of brood, I'm not splitting it. Because <laughs> you're just gonna have two dead hives potentially. <laughs> I don't wanna uh, take so much from that original that I, I compromise either one of them. So that was a, a really great overview of, you know, uh, in a nutshell, how to make a split. And if, if you, watched that and came away more confused than when it started, then uh, this next slide is, is for you. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you're not quite sure on how to make a split, um, you know, then, then like I mentioned in the beginning, we do have a virtual split class this Saturday that you can still sign up for. And then we have in-person split classes also uh, coming up shortly in, in March. But Lauren did a great job of kind of giving a quick overview of how to do it, but there's a lot to making a split. And, uh, and so you can certainly sign up for that class. It's about a two to three hour course, depending on which one you pick. And so that, that's why we can't just cover it tonight because it would take the entire night just to, just to cover splits. So. so one other quick thing that I want to cover before you know, we, we move on to a couple other topics is you know, excess old honey on hives. This is a really common problem. Now you can't see my notes because um, I started uh, I started the Zoom, I, I usually start the Zoom call at about six o'clock each evening. And at about 6.05, I realized that uh, I, didn't, I didn't finish filling in the notes on this slide. So, <laughs> and I couldn't shut it down to go back and do that. So, um, so one, one common problem that a lot of folks have is they, they get through winter and they did too good of a job maybe uh, feeding their hives and their, their hive still has a lot of honey stored on it, whether it's in the second brood box or maybe even you've got three or four boxes on your hive that are all full of honey. And, or maybe they just brought in a lot of fall honey and you've still got all this excess honey and there's no way they're gonna eat it all before the new honey flow starts again in you know, early May in most regions in Texas. So what do you, what do, you do with it? So, 
I want to go over a couple of things. You've got two, two main goals when it comes to uh, getting rid of that old honey. One goal is you always want to make sure you've got room for the queen to lay. And we, we talked about that a little earlier, just making sure that, you know, the, the brood nests aren't so full of honey, there's nowhere for the queen to lay. So you, you, all, you gotta make sure there's room for the queen, especially going into spring when she needs a lot of room. And then the second goal is that you might need those uh, supers. You know, if you've got, still got supers full of honey above your two brood boxes, you might need those supers for honey. <laughs> and so you need, to, you, know, you need to get the old honey out so the bees can start putting new honey in, you know, once the honey flow starts in late April or early May. So with those two goals in mind, room for the queens, and getting your hunting supers back, there's three basic scenarios I wanna go over with you and uh, on how to handle that. Number, the first scenario is probably the most common. You've got two brood boxes, no additional supers above them. And the second brood box has, you know, a few frames of brood and isn't completely full of honey, but has more than 20 pounds surplus that we kind of talked about maintaining. So you've got a bottom box with a lot of brood in it isn't honey bound. Your second brood box say has, you know, 40 pounds of stored honey instead of 20. Um, what do you do? I wouldn't do anything with a hive like that in March. I would just let them keep eating, let them keep growing, um, let, them, let, them, let them go. You know, if you've got plenty of room, you know, if you've got, I'm going to say four to six frames that the queen can lay on that are mostly empty on the bottom, in the bottom box. And then you've got a couple frames in the top box that, that, have room for her to lay, I wouldn't touch it. Even if it's got more than 20 pounds, let them keep eating that honey, let them keep growing. If you still have that problem in say the second week of April, then we might need to do something about it, but we'll talk about that in April. The second scenario that you might run into is you've got again, two brood boxes, no additional honey supers over it, but that second brood box is totally full of honey. So there's nowhere for the queen to lay in that second brood box, it's completely full of honey. And your bottom box, let's say, you know, it might have room for her to lay or not. But if your second box in March is completely full of honey, I like to pull out three or, you know, three, well, I'm going to say two to four uh, frames of honey out of the middle of that upper brood box, set them out about 30, 40 feet away from your hives, let the bees rob all the honey out of them, and then replace them back in the hive. And I essentially just now gave that queen room to now lay. She can now move up into the second brood box and start laying. And, and so it's important to make sure she's got room to, to continue laying eggs and there's not so much old honey stored that she can't lay. So you, you wanna make sure you know, you're still leaving 20-ish pounds of honey up in that second box. Uh, but remember 20 pounds is half of a medium or about a third of a deep box full. So a deep box completely full of honey weighs about 60 pounds. Medium box completely full weighs about 40 pounds. So, you know, pulling a few of those center frames out, letting them rob them out, no big deal. The third and final scenario you might be running into is you might have, you know, a couple honey supers above your two brood boxes still full of honey. And if that's the case, what I usually recommend doing is, you know, when you've got a really nice warm week, pull those additional honey supers that are full of honey still off of the hives, set out the whole box as a honey, let the bees rob them out, and then you can store those honey supers uh, to be used right before the honey flow starts. Now you can, you know, I'm, I'm talking honey supers, right? Not, not brood boxes. So, you know, you're not pulling brood boxes off. You know, if you've got, you're not, you're not pulling one of your two brood boxes off and letting the bees rob it out. You're only pulling off those, you know, the honey supers above your brood boxes that you left on all winter long. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, if not, then uh, bug Sherry and James or, or put it in the Q and A box and I'm, I'm coming up to my turn to answer questions. So <laughs> um, spring requeening, I wanna just hit this fairly quickly because uh, we wanna get to, to James and Sherry's portion. Um, and uh, oh, one quick thing I forgot to mention, I saw somebody put it in the chat, but um, some, some folks were asking, you know, can I harvest the honey out of those honey supers instead of letting the bees rob it out? You can, as long as you didn't put a mite treatment in the hive that would prevent the human consumption of honey. 
So, you know, there's some mite treatments that are safe even when you have honey supers on. So as long as you used a mite treatment that was safe to use with honey, um, you can harvest that honey and, and eat it out of those honey supers, um, even if it's old. So now again, if you use the synthetic mite treatment that's not safe to use uh, when there's honey on for human consumption, you can't use that old honey. So um, real quick on spring requeening, we'll touch on this again in April because most people end up requeening in April. But I wanna just uh, give you a quick heads up on a couple of things. You know, I do recommend people try to requeen proactively each year. So I do recommend everybody requeens their hive once per year. The ideal time is April or May. You've got queens readily available. You've got a nectar flow going then, which means the bees will readily accept queens. Um, and then I'm gonna push you to our website or our YouTube channel where we've got a lot of videos on when to requeen, finding queens, how to find a queen when you can't find a queen, et cetera. While we're on this topic, I want to jump, jump over to uh, Dr. Jamie Ellis, and uh, he was kind enough to um, film some videos for us that also appear in our Texas Bee Supply Monthly. And I want to show you his opinion on uh, when to, uh, how frequently to requeen hives. So here's Dr. Ellis, who if you've been in the beekeeping community for a while, he's a pretty amazing resource. Beekeepers in the U.S. report that queen uh, quality is one of the leading causes of stress in their hives. And it's not just the fact that queens are good or bad, it's, it's also partly the fact that queen longevity is not as great, at least a lot of beekeepers report, as it has been in years in the past. So this brings up a regular question. How often should I requeen my colony? The general recommendation is requeening colonies is um, advisable at least once per year. I usually say once per year. You really want a new, young, uh, vibrant, vigorous queen in your colonies, usually in super early spring, because she's going to be the one who's producing lots of eggs, therefore lots of brood to carry your colony through production season. So I think requeening once per year is advisable. Now, let me give you a little secret. Even as a beekeeper, I've faced this myself. Some of us are so happy to just have a queen that we will allow the queen to stay in that hive, whether she is good or bad. And I certainly don't recommend that. We need to have strong, productive queens in our hive. So if whatever reason you think your queen is underperforming, you should requeen her as well. So I said requeen once a year but a queen can go bad. She might die, she might disappear, she might not be productive. So you have to be willing to solve future problems by requeening as often as necessary if requeening once a year um, wasn't enough for a particular colony. So there you go, from uh, one, of the, one of the foremost uh, experts in the industry, um, Dr. Jamie Ellis. So, I want to go over with you really quickly now how to requeen a hive, and I'm going to show you another video. This one's only a couple minutes long, but it's going to go over, you know, if you, if you do want to requeen proactively, then this is how you requeen a hive. So just hang tight for a second, and I will pull this up. Okay. Everybody, let's talk about requeening a hive. So if you've watched our previous videos, we've identified a hive that needs a new queen. And so we're going to go through and actually show the process once we've already identified a hive that needs to be requeened. We're going to show the process of how to requeen that hive. One thing is you've got to find that queen. So give them some just a little bit of smoke and you can check out our other video on how to find a queen. But for this video we're not going to talk about that but you can always reference back to that video so we're going to find our queen and we're going to have to remove her from the hive 
and the big debate is always, do you leave her in the hive? Do you uh, kill her and leave her in the hive, or do you remove her from the hive? I always like removing the queen, because even if she is no longer alive, she's still giving off pheromones inside that hive. And we want those pheromones to dissipate as quickly as possible. So, all right, here she is on this side. So I'll give her, remove her from the hive. There we go. All right, so I've removed the queen from this hive. Now I've got my new queen. You can wait up to 24 hours to install the new queen. Or if you already have her, you can install her right away after killing her. It's ideal to wait, you know, 2 to 24 hours just so all those pheromones from the old queen dissipate. But since we're here with this video, we're going to go ahead and install her. So your queen cages come in all different forms. Sometimes they'll have a little cork that plugs up the candy. So you can see we've got candy in here. I just removed that cork so that candy is exposed so the bees can chew and let her out over the next few days. And so I'm going to install this right in the heart of the brood nest, right between these frames, the candy side facing, uh, facing down. Just going to slip in there right like that. I'm going to push that tightly back together. And you can see the bees already smell her. They're already running towards that new queen. It's going to take them two to four days to release that queen. I'm going to come back in about seven days and check and make sure I see eggs in this hive. As soon as I see eggs, I'm going to close it back up and give them another week or so before I do a deep dive inspection. And that's how you requeen a hive. Simple as that. So there you go. Uh, simple as that. <laughs> um, so requeening doesn't have to be complicated. And like I mentioned, you know, we've got a lot more videos out there on you know, how to identify a hive that does need to be requeened, you know, how to find the queen, tips on finding queens, et cetera. So um, I'm painfully aware that the audio is pretty terrible on a lot of our videos. We finally just invested in some uh, real high tech uh, sound devices that will muffle out all the bees and all the wind. So we're gonna start refilming all of our videos and adding a lot. Uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully you won't be able to hear the uh, the wind and the bees as much. So last slide I've got before we jump over to the elums and that's just hive inspections. You know, what should you expect to see in, um, you know, in the bee yard? You know, I, I've seen in most of my hives, uh, you know, three plus frames of brood. And that's, you know, of course, regional and hive population dependent. I'm kind of talking on average. You know, super strong hives may have eight frames of brood. Really weak hives may have a half a frame of brood. But I'm seeing on average about three frames of brood. And, uh, and, and that's behind. You know, I would usually like to see, you know, five or so at this time, depending on where you are in the state. So uh, it's a little behind, but that's kind of what I'm seeing. I, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm seeing that brood break in a lot of hives where, you know, I'm seeing eggs and cat brood <laughs> or eggs and larvae, but no cat brood, because there was that, you know, two week, you know, seven day to 14 day break where the queen kind of stopped laying, or it got so cold that the brood got chilled and, and died. I'm seeing low but increasing pollen stores. And, you know, again, I'm looking for 20 pounds of honey in that second box. And then at this point, again, you should see an actively laying queen. You should see eggs, you should see larva, otherwise, your hive is queenless. Once these weather, the weather has started warming back up, there's a pollen trickle, you know, right after that cold snap, if you didn't see eggs or larva, that's okay. The queen just shut down, but you should definitely be seeing eggs and larva again at, at this point. So, okay, with that, James and Sherry are gonna talk about swarm, preventing swarms and uh, swarms in general, which is really important because March is swarm season. So. Um, that is super important and I'm going to let them dive into that and I'm going to jump over and, and start answering your questions. So Sherry, um, I think you're on and mute, but like, there you go. Can you see me? You, you can't see me. I can see you. I can show you. <laughs> you're sitting beside <laughs> me. <laughs> okay, now I can see me. Can you see me now? I can see you now. Okay. Hi, everybody. Y'all's questions are really good. I'm going to just tell you right now, they, um, they are, they're a real they workout get, too. My goodness. 
Look at that. Can you hear it? I think it's swarm season. Oh God. I think it is too. Isn't that impressive? You know, that's that's a show of strength. When you look at that, that's kind of like those girls are pumping their arms saying, we got this. <laughs> you know something though that, that's occurring there that we don't see? Do you know that a queen is the least likely member of that entire colony to want to go with that swarm? <laughs> they got a drag her. So they have to drag her. They have to pull. It's kind of like the great drone dump and that they're, they have to push her out because she doesn't want to go. So we're not seeing her fly there just yet. <laughs> not that, yet. That explains why sometimes colonies our swarms don't go very far. That's right. They hang in the tree and then turn around and come back home. Say, hey, lady, Say, come on. Where are you? <laughs> well, let's get moving. Let's get moving. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, what a great program so far. So much to talk about this month. But we, our little assignment was uh, is swarm management because it's really, it's our goal to not let those girls, half of the girls go and um, vamoose with that beautiful either Texas 5000 or Golden Cordovan Queen. We, we really want those uh, last year queens to stay in the yard and let us kind of gradually work them out and not, not lose them to a tree. Yeah, swarm management is, is not only critical, it's also fun. And there's a, lot of things you, there's a lot of things you can research on swarm management. And I'm gonna give you a couple of tidbits as we go through the program this, at, this evening. Yeah, one of those is look this up. Look up Delia Allen. D-E-L-I-A-A-L-L-E-N, 1956, and research shaking. 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 Queen shaking, bees shaking. It's an event that occurs just prior to a swarm occurring. And there's oh. also one, which I call the 45 degree angle test, okay. in which a large population of bees sit there on a 45 degree angle like they're getting ready to take off. But if you, if you like advanced topics, look that up and you'll be fascinated by her papers and her study. Now I'm going to have to because I didn't know it either. Surprise. Um, surprise, surprise. All right, so this slide, I love this slide of this chessboard. I want this chessboard, but it really is to, to I, I think, drill home the point that it is strategy. We've got strategy going here. We need to kind of know what's going on in our hive to know what we need to be doing. And you know that that's really so important and so fun in that, as beekeepers, we have a challenge of trying to, to we have a challenge of trying to grow our honeybee population or colony population to a level where we feel comfortable that we're going to get a, the maximum honey production possible. We have a class that we used to do called uh -huh. maximizing honey right. production. But at the same time, we've got to work towards preventing the swarm and keeping an eye out for mm -hmm. all those swarm signs that are coming along. So it is kind of a dilemma. Where is that fine line? Where do we stop? We've got to be strategic. All right, so what's happening in the, in the hive? Well, right now, and in swarm season, we're seeing a rapid population buildup. Our bees are growing so fast, it's just incredible. Yeah. As Blake was saying, we had this ridiculous weather come through, but the bees have overcome it so fast, mm -hmm. and pollen is coming in, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the elm trees and the ashes are, are starting just again. like they did again. The um, slowly, yeah, some of the flowers are. are starting to come back, so it's amazing. So, population is building again because the pollen's coming in, that's right. And or, or we're helping them out either way. Uh, we're Once we got that um freeze behind us, this really will start to happen. It was happening, but now it's happening again. So, everybody just sit tight if it's not happening as fast as you want it to, it will. But this is the this is what's happening inside when your colony's preparing to swarm. Rapid population buildup, the brood nest becomes constricted, limited space for bees, brood and honey. Everything starts to come, become congested. And what else? Presence, Presence of drones. drones. We had a, one of our questions a while ago was someone, had a, someone had a full frame of drones. Yeah. It completely occupied. They had three frames of brood say, and unusual. one frame, one full frame of adult drones. That's amazing. That's a large it? population. You know, uh, uh, Mother Nature is fascinating in that the way yeah. the way that a colony's population buildup can be restricted uh, goes into that second item, brood nest being constricted. Mm -hmm. So as the colony is attempting to outgrow itself and the colony says it's time for us to perpetuate our species, mm -hmm. it's time for us to prepare for swarm, they start taking things away. And where we would normally think the nectar coming in would be placed in, in our honey supers, uh, we haven't gotten there yet with our honey supers. Yep, so early. we're putting it back in the brood mm -hmm. nest. Every time a cell opens, they pop it back in with nectar. 
and that then prohibits the queen from laying. That's right. And that's where that last is. Queen slows laying because of lack of room. It's really a, it's a strange little um, happening, like a dance almost, them preparing for a swarm. All of these little um, aspects come into play about what they're doing. They're, they're storing comb, uh, honey, nectar where it shouldn't go. They're starving the queen basically so she can fly. It's just a strange little dance that they work weeks in advance. Isn't that true? Weeks right. in advance of a swarm. There's a, I ran across something when I was we're kind of studying for this uh, topic tonight. And uh, I'm not sure who it was that, that I read it from, but it defined a colony of, of bees as having four seasons through the course of the year. Now that, re that those seasonal uh, um, events can repeat themselves once or twice mm -hmm. or more, mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was uh, four phases. First phase is build up, which we're going through. All right. The second phase is reproduction. Which That's what we're talking swarm. about now. That's our swarm cycle. The right. colony is reproducing. The third phase is food storage, which we know is coming up with our major nectar flows sure. for the individual sure. areas. And the last phase is dearth. Sure. Now we can repeat this after the dearth. It can start over sure. again. We have colony buildup. We could have fall flows and mm -hmm. such. But yeah, isn't it sure. interesting that we go to build up reproduction, food storage, and dearth? I think that's, so that's where we Oliver. are right now. We're in the swarm cycle. We are. We are. I think that was Randy Oliver that he read that from because I've seen that too as well. So your actions going into swarm season depend on your goal. That may be a strange little way of putting it, but what is your goal moving forward? Are you wanting to grow a colony? Are you wanting to maximize your honey production? James used that term a minute ago. Or are you wanting to expand your bee yard? Because kind of all that kind of matters to what your decision moving forward and time, but what your de decisions moving forward is. Because if you uh, want to keep that box at too deep and not split it, then we're gonna have a solution for you here in a second. If you're a single deep and you just need to grow bees, we're gonna have a solution for you. But those actions do depend on what your goal is as a beekeeper right now. I was interested in both Blake and Lauren's description of what the appropriate uh, colony size is. And, yep. and they had a general consensus that a deep and a medium is really fairly appropriate for the hobbyist beekeeper. Works. And uh, we always work with double deeps. We like okay. double deeps. Uh, I like the presence of a lot of bees, yeah. but you know, there's a lot to be said for that. And that mm -hmm. when a colony, a colony gets too large, they also get very aggressive, yeah, very they defensive. They can. So there, so that's a consideration. Well, and having that medium is a little smaller box to, yes. to deal with. So very interesting. I like seeing the different opinions, truthfully. All right, so we're adding an additional brew box. Let's start there. So you, you're a single deep or even a double deep and you're running out of space because you're 80% full. And what's our goal here? Our goal is to reduce the population within the colony because swarms initially occur because of excess number of bees. Mm -hmm. So many bees in the box. And there's lots of things that occur as a result of that. There's reduced passing of, of brood pheromone throughout mm -hmm. the colonies. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can cause a situation where, where queen cells are created that weren't necessary. But regardless, oh, that's a congestion. That's right. That 80% right. full is our number, mm -hmm. of not only for a brood box, but also for honey supers. That's right. But that's our number for expansion during a nectar flow. It is. And it we're is. there. It's and coming. so if you're adding that second deep or the third deep, then you're going to want to give it some bait. All right. What did you call it? Priming it. Prime that top box. Pull up a frame or two of brood and food. It, if you set a deep box on top of another box, that's even if it's busting with bees, you still need to prime that with some bees. Because if you don't, I can tell you, odds are the minute there's nectar flow coming in, they're gonna make that a honey super and they may still swarm. Just giving them, giving that queen a little bit of a ladder to just say, you know what, here's you a top story. Here's you a place to go up, start laying, and now you've got a whole nother house you can start laying to, to grow into. That's, that's a version of, of what we teach Pyramid. and call pyramiding. That's right. And that it's less extensive because all we're doing is like Sherry said, we're just priming it. We're, 
we're just getting it started. I had mm -hmm. to prime a water pump today. <laughs> I had to give it something to work right. with. And the same's true with our bees. Give, right. give them a reason to go up top. That's right. And feed one-to-one -one syrup to draw a comb. If you've only got a brand new box, and a lot of you coming out of winter with a single deep, uh, new beekeepers last year, um, you're gonna only have a brand new, brand new foundation. Go ahead and, and feed that one-to-one -one syrup to draw out more comb. And even if you do have some drawn comb in there, if you've got new foundation, perfectly good to go ahead and continue to feed one-to-one -one syrup so they've got the resources to build more comb because you won't, then things aren't gonna happen unless they've got comb to, for things to happen in. Right. So. We, had, we had a question a while ago uh, from a new beekeeper who simply questioned, what does one-to-one -one mean? Oh, and yeah. so, you know, sometimes we make assumptions that, that our, know. That our friends true. and neighbors and new beekeepers know what we're talking right. about. The same is true with drawn and undrawn foundation. Those are terminology in beekeeping that we all want to become familiar with. Well, let me stop and make that a segue, a plug, if you will. In this month's uh, Texas Bee Supply Monthly, near the end of it, I've got a page that's a sugar syrup recipe page that tells you how to make one-to-one -one and two-to-one syrup with bags of sugar, which is kind of simplistic, but y'all, that's the way we've done it for years. Um, Cause you can do a lot of colonies with simply four and 10 pound bags of sugar and 25 pound bags of sugar. But so look it up in the magazine. It's just simple sugar, water and sugar mixed together and the recipes in the magazine. But the last on this slide is a helpful hint. Add additional wax to those new foundation frames. I can tell you firsthand, we've waxed many a frames that it does give them a little head start in building in a box. And that could be even for honey supers. This holds true for that as well. So you might want to make that a goal for you. I ran across another one of those little tidbits. I bet I wasn't supposed to switch, That's quite all right. No, I'm sorry, right. I, I should have done this earlier. A word to look up if you don't already know it. It was new to me but uh, some researching in regards to a BP or, or brood pheromone. Uh, the word came up, uh, <laughs> if I say it like they say it on the, on the computer, <laughs> it goes fecundity, uh, F-E-C-U-N-D-I-T-Y. Signal. Fecundity signal. Uh, that's a, that's, it. that's, that's signals that's um, emitted oh, by brood pheromone uh, to say to the colony that everything is correct, everything's right or the lack thereof that things are wrong. And if our brood is currently being produced heavily, then our colony knows it's not swarm time. New word, word if of it, the day. If it starts, if it starts <laughs> being limited, then we know during a, during a nectar flow that uh, a, uh, a, a swarm is, is imminent. imminent, it's coming up. You're so smart. Yeah, don't keep messing with that. That's going to love the really F -E -C -U -N -D -I -T -Y. good up the yeah. it's, it's a not neat word. It is a yeah. neat word. All right, so super early. Not super early, but super early. Truly, and I was supposed to put a comma in here. It's going to drive me nuts that I can see I didn't. The moment nectar starts flowing in, bees will put nectar anywhere there is an open spot. That's why you will see backfilling of the brood nest. One of your first indications that a swarm is going to happen is when you see nectar deposited where there should be eggs and larvae. Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. That will be That's your right. your neon light to say ding 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 I need to get in there and move some things around or make one of these actions. It, it kind of shows up you know a typical a typical brood frame that has all of the resources the honey nectar pollen on it and the honey around the, out in the corners left and right. Typically at the, at the end of that, there's a, there's a band where the brood and the honey meet. Mm -hmm. And once that first row of cells starts having nectar in mm -hmm. it, we know it's not supposed to be there because that was full capped honey. That's once right. that shows up, that's telling us that there's, there's nectar coming in that the bees are not using mm -hmm. the way we want it to be used. Right. So what we're saying is if you've got honey supers, you're, you're a, a double deep already. One of the one of your ways to manage swarms is to put your supers on early. That way they're not backfilling the brood nest. They've got a place to put it in the pantry upstairs and everything's humming along beautifully. So super early than late. Don't miss out on the opportunity nature is providing. And it also provides a little additional clustering space for short term. It does, it does. Um, okay, so now next, equalizing brood nest. For those that are wanting to keep that double deep 
or triple deep or, or deep and a half, wherever you are, if you're wanting to keep it there and not go more, but you want to maximize your honey production and just kind of stay level, but still be able to keep your bee yard all healthy and going well. All with the goal of? Swarm yeah. management. Swarm management, that's right. We're not just teaching equalizing brood. No. The concept Swarm is that we're using this as a tool yeah. to help offset uh, the, the, the conditions of a swarm. That's right. So number one there, choose a frame with mostly capped brood and shake the bees off into that donor hive. All right, shake them off, leave them in there, leave them there. You're just wanting that brood to go to that other needy colony in order to help it. Place this frame in the center of a needy colony's brood nest, the center. Then it's, it's a brood frame, so it, it has to go frame. in the brood nest. And then replace the pulled frame with a drawn comb frame to the outside edge of the brood nest. Now that doesn't say the outside of the box. To the outside of the brood nest, drawn comb, if you've got drawn comb. If no drawn comb, then you'll need to put that further out towards the edge of the box. I want to point out that that fully capped frame of, of uh, brood, that's, that's that three to one ratio James brought up either last month or month before, that a fully capped brood frame is really three frames of brood. You talk about a boost and shot in the arm, that colony, that needy colony is going to get a ton of bees within just a matter of days. With that, A, a key indicator of an impending swarm mm -hmm. is excessive numbers of fully capped brood frames. Yeah, uh, If is. we have five, uh, then it's going to require 15. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's right. 15 frames to control them. So uh, that, that was a, a, an unusual choice of words, control them. But it's really well, true. Control we are controlling them. That's right. All right, so now we've equalized brood. Let's equalize bees. So to equalize bees, choose an open brood frame, open, uncapped, wet brood, however you want to classify it, uncapped brood frame covered in nurse bees, less the queen. We don't want to take her. We want her to stay in the donor eye. Smoke lightly to the entrance of the hive you're going to be putting in and gently shake those nurse bees off at the entrance. Then put that install, using my words like I've got them listed on the frame, install that frame in the center of the brood nest. Those bees will just walk right in and get right back on it. You're gonna find less fighting and less little- You, you said something that's interesting that, that some people may not have done before. And that is, that is, a. Uh, uh, shaking the nurse bees at the entrance mm -hmm. as opposed to inside the box. Right. Um, uh, and that, provide, that provides kind of a transitional period mm -hmm. where they can go in and what are they doing? They're actually headed back to that, that frame, frame mm -hmm. that frame of open brood. They know where they belong, they're heading there. So they're yeah. going to go back in. You don't have to dump them right on top. And by not doing so, we relieve potential pressure on the queen yeah. and there's less infighting, even though in theory, uh, nurse nurse bees there. can go anywhere and, yeah. not, and not bother anyone. We've done it both ways. Yeah. And then replace that frame in the donor hive with either a drawn comb uh, where the frame was removed or undrawn frame to the outside of the box. I want to point out, and I may say it again, so pardon me if I repeat myself, never, ever, ever put an undrawn new foundation in the middle of a brood nest. And, why are, and why are we equalizing the bees? We're wanting to- To help a bird swarm. No. <laughs> You're testing it. I'm keep doing it. <laughs> Why okay. are we going to equalize honey? That, that answer right. Why are we going to equalize honey? <laughs> same reason. Same reason. So choose a capped or uncapped frame from your donor hive. Shake off the bees. And I can tell you there'll be very few bees on that because bees don't actually live on honey frames. And then pull the, an unutilized frame from a needy colony to make space for that honey frame. Then place that honey frame right beside the brood nest in that needy colony. Because if a needy colony is a needy colony, that means that they don't have a honey resource and you're feeding them. Bees don't like to travel a long way to get to it. They need their pantry close to their, where their, their brood nest is. So put it close to that brood nest, especially if it's very, it's a dink, a dinky colony. Isn't it interesting that, that we can share resources oh, in it. our colonies and accomplish multiple goals. We, we can, 
we can prop up a colony that's not doing so well, that didn't, didn't overwinter so well. Mm -hmm. We can relieve pressure on a colony that's thriving. We can use those resources for making, making new colonies, mm -hmm. nucleus colonies and such, which we'll briefly discuss in a minute. So we have a lot of flexibility as beekeepers once we understand the basic biologies and the, the resource requirements of our colonies. What does that lend itself to? I mean, it's having more than one colony is beneficial. Having three colonies is really beneficial. We had a call today about a swarm that was impending because of a- I'll finish the slide in a swarm, second. We're talking swarm cells were present <laughs> in the colony. Yep. And um, some would say it's too early. Some would say, no, it's not. Well, we say, no, it's not because we, have, right. we have the living proof, but there's always a reason. And potentially it's maybe a little bit early if the colony is in ideal situation mm -hmm. coming out of winter, but it turns out that the brood boxes were not reversed Back in uh, like we discussed mm -hmm. a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of it, in this particular instance, the queen did not move down. Mm -hmm. So the colony was living in that upper deep. Right, and, and about to swarm. A simple little reversal could have averted yeah. that swarm cell being present. So, so she had a completely different plan of attack so, because of that. So now she's gonna to have to go into the next slide, which is-, yeah. which well, is I'm uh, not finished with this one. Once Sherry finishes that, <laughs> to, to uh, initiate a, a, an early split. season split yeah, using, right. using her swarm cells. That's right. All right, so to finish those last two that I'm sure y'all have read by now, <laughs> replace the honey nectar frame from the donor hive with a new or drawn foundation, not a lot unlike the previous slide, um, to the outside edge of the box. And caution, did I say this before? Never, ever, ever separate the brood with honey frames or really any undrawn, it's gotta be a drawn frame if you're gonna put drawn comb frames in the middle, if you're gonna do so. All right, so making splits. Oh, my picture went away. Well, I have a picture there. Isn't that attractive? Well, y'all are going to have to well, pretend like that's a picture of bees. It's a picture of a single deep, which, <laughs> by the way, is very difficult to uh, prevent from swarming. Yeah. Uh, if you want management um, challenges, raise your bees in a single deep and a single deep only with a new queen, oh, a boy. fresh queen. That can be tough. That but can that's be what tough. that was. It was it was a swarm hanging on the side of a single deep box. Yeah. All right, so making splits. Are queens available? Let's, let's you know, we, we talk about that a little bit on, on the social media in the last couple of days of do I make a split? Do, can my colony's busting like we were just talking about? Can I make a split? Well, purchase queens aren't available yet, y'all. We're, we're not there yet. We've still got some weeks to go. If not, you're dealing with a homegrown queen, which can work in a pinch, but it's not the ideal. I, I would prefer that predictability of a nice Texas 5000 or Golden Cordovan Queen, wouldn't well, that's, you? That's making the assumption that, that we did not reach this point, yeah. to where, but, we're, but we're here. We, did. we yeah. have a swarm that's yeah. coming because well, we she have swarm did. cells. Yeah, she uh, did. So, we have, so we have to do something about it. So we do have to use that cell. Yeah. Uh, we're going to hope for the best. And if it turns out mm -hmm. that that queen is not ideal, mm -hmm. then we'll order a new one from TBS that's right. and we'll, we'll start over with mm -hmm. her. But at least we kept the colony intact. And that's a good point. And I will say that the very sweet friend of ours that made that phone call today had destroyed those queen cells. Um, so don't do that. that it's not going to stop your swarm. Keep them in the, and reuse them for a split if you have Fortunately, to. Fortunately, they'll rebuild if yeah. we have larvae of the proper items. Right. And then that last bullet point, divide resources. That's a split. Moving the queen from the original hive to the split. And that's key when you have one that's already got a swarm cell. That, that queen, she's prepped to swarm. So move her. If you're going to split that colony, move her and leave the swarm cells in that original location. Well, another another definition of a split is a, a control, a beekeeper controlled swarm, mm -hmm. where we're actually in charge of when and how it happens. And if we make all, all decisions mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. we retain those bees in both colonies, the mother colony and the new colony yeah. are successful. There's the slide. That's what you were thinking, Lauren. It was the other one, the picture. Well, the picture went away. Right where it's we that closed. little gremlin that's living in this computer that got Blake's on it. It is. It took our picture away. But now we have this picture. So what now? Okay, so this has happened. Hadn't happened to us, but we've gotten a many a phone call that I got home from work and I saw this. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Well, this is what we call you're in a peach. 
So you're going to take a nude box or a spare hive box or a cardboard box, that whatever box you can come up with, and you're gonna rake those bees off into that box. You're gonna cover the entrance with a queen excluder. Now this is where some back stock of stuff and old parts can really come in handy. Queen excluders are just as the name implies for new beekeepers. It excludes the queen from being able to pass through wherever it's located, that queen excluder is located. But we keep little pieces of a queen excluder so that we can just attach that on the front of a box or a nuke box or whatever that we've had to capture a swarm in. And that way we can trap them in there and that queen can't fly. So therefore that, that colony, half a colony, should stay put at least till we make further provisions. Once we move those bees into what's going to be their new temporary or permanent home, regardless, right. we have to consider whether we need to feed or not. Every one of those bees that are in that picture there have their honey stomachs are just full as they can be of, of nectar or of honey that they consumed prior to leaving. leaving the colony. Right. They need that for Wax they production. think they're moving into a tree, but they're really not. <laughs> they're moving into a box, box. that we're providing. <laughs> but in a tree, they would have absolutely no resources. So that's where they would make their wax from. Right. Well, once that colony is, is transplanted into a new box, which we're going to do, they still have that to make nectar or to right. make wax with. Right. But ideally, we'd love them to go into a drawn colony if possible. Right. The feed. Be prepared to feed that. And then move it to another location if possible, not, and we keep using that word if possible, um, because it's not ideal for them to stay right beside that. If, even if you just move them across your property or worst case scenario, right beside it, if that's as far as you can go, but turn it around and orient it completely an opposite direction than they would have previously traveled to well, get inside. Lauren talked about splits. Yeah. And again, that's that's what this is. This is a split. It is. Uh, so the same rules and, and thoughts apply that right. she was discussing. That's right. And last bullet point, and I can't stress this enough. I should have made it bold. Go into that original hive as soon as you possibly can and determine any action needed because you just lost over half your bees to that swarm and the queen. But be very, very careful because you probably, I'm sure, have swarm, swarm cells about to emerge in there. So be very ginger if you're going to pull frames that you don't crush your only hope of having another queen, a daughter queen, survive for that existing leftover hive. And you may be prepared to have to reduce this box down because again, you lost at least 50 to 60% of your bees. You're gonna need to take that like this box, two, two boxes, probably down to one, if not maybe even further down to a nuke size. You know, un unlike a supersedure cell, which is on the face of a frame, swarm cells typically or are at the, the very bottom, bottom mm -hmm. or on the lower, le or lower ledge mm -hmm. of that bottom of the frame. Yeah. And uh, it's not so hard pulling them out without to dam not to damage them, but, but going back. back in can be yeah. very difficult. Again. So if sure. you're doing that, then remove some frames left, right, give yourself room to, right. to, to maneuver that frame. And our last slide is stay involved with your bees. Know your bees, stay involved in their lives like we do our kids, right? You want to be doing frequent hive checks and that's gonna be your number one, your number one defense against swarms is to manage your colonies. Let's, your let's colonies. recap real quick. Why do, why do colonies <laughs> swarm? Yes, nature calls and tells them to swarm, but they swarm because of, of, their, of being overpopulated, mm -hmm. overly populated. Right. They swarm when they've maximized the amount of honey that they can store, that reduces the space for the queen to lay in, forces a swarm to occur. So they're all key little things that we can spot when we go in and That's do right. our hive inspections. That's right. Sherry's saying, hurry up, hurry I up. I am. Well, it's 8 30. We're over about three minutes. We're done, Blake. Let me quit. <laughs> let me stop sharing. Great job, guys. Thank you so much for that. That was fun. You're welcome. Absolutely. So that's about it, folks. Let me um, share a couple quick things in, in parting with you. Um, thank you for jumping on with us tonight. As always, if you have any questions, you're welcome to shoot them to help at texasbeesupply.com. We had some issues with that email address. And so uh, we had a massive backlog that we didn't see that kind of went to a spam folder. So if you send an email to that and didn't get a response, you will be getting a response. Um, and we've got that issue worked out. So you'll get a follow-up email in a couple of days. It's gonna have a recording to this webinar, links to everything we talked about and links to our magazine. And with that, we will see you 
all in April.